My name is Mike Frazier. I'm one of the board members of the Rhinebeck Historic Society and delighted to see the turnout tonight for Brian McAdoo's program. We're, uh, in a sense, repeating a program that Brian and his students presented here in this room. It was in December, about a little over a year ago. Um, and the room was packed for that presentation. Uh, <clears throat> Brian became interested in, in local history through the region's graveyards not long after starting <clears throat> at Vassar in 1998. Uh, that summer, he helped. It. We've got uh, plenty of seats in here. You just need to make your way toward the far end of some of those aisles. Um, <clears throat> that summer, he helped teach a course in Jamaica uh, that used geophysical equipment to survey an old coffee plantation there that had been run by slaves. Uh, not only was this an excellent way to give the archaeologists that would be excavating the site a head start, uh, but it also succeeded in attracting a diverse student body that would be interested in learning the history of a marginalized people. Uh, not long after returning home to the Hudson Valley, a group in New Pulse was interested in exploring the Huguenots' history of slave ownership by surveying a graveyard in that community's Huguenot Street. That project led to other Ulster County sites in the town of Gardner at the family cemetery near the home of a slave owner and the Ulster County poorhouse where many former enslaved people ended up after they were freed. The Vassar College Digital Underground class found evidence of over 1,200 graves on that particular site. That led to investigating the Dutchess County Courthouse located in Millbrook, um, where Dr. McAdoo and students found geophysical evidence for hundreds of forgotten graves under the brambles on the hillside above the former poorhouse there in Millbrook. Subsequent surveys covered a burial, slave burial ground in Stormville, in the southern, way in the southern, southwestern part of the county, a supposed African American burial ground behind the St. James Episcopal Church, right next door here in Hyde Park. Uh, and the Potter's Field right here in Rhinebeck at our Rhinebeck Association Cemetery that illuminated the rich history of blacks in this part of Dutchess County, and that's what we're going to hear about tonight. In his other professional work, when he's not wandering around graveyards, um, <laughs> Professor McAdoo reaches, researches uh, natural disasters around the world. He's participated in and he's led post-disaster surveys in Indonesia, in the Solomon Islands, in Haiti, and most recently in Japan following the tsunami there. Brian, it's our pleasure and delight to have you back here tonight. Thanks Thank so you. So I need to set a couple things straight. Mike is way too generous in saying that, that, that I was doing this work. And if any of you guys were here back in December when we did the presentation, you realized it was the students that do the work. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, these are the students that worked on this particular project. One of the students, Alicia Jago, is uh, here tonight. Who's going to um, show you how little I know about this subject because <laughs> she is, is really um, distinguished herself as being an expert in the history um, section of this of this class as well as the geophysical part. So um, this this class would my interests are varied. I sort of have attention deficit disorder, I think, which is kind of fun when you're a professor because you can check out lots of different things. But there's no way that I could hold this much information in my brain um, without the students. So this is really the students' work that I'm presenting tonight. Um, they've done an amazing job. The way I run the class is, I mean, Alicia can tell you, first day of class, okay, somewhere in this field are buried are, are some graves. Go find them. And 
that's the class. There's no exams, there's no homework, I don't tell them what to do, they make all the decisions in the class, so this really is student work. They can come to me for advice, but otherwise it's their work. So all these students here, about half the students on this list were um, students of history. We had a fortuitous um, coincidence that there was an African American history class that was being taught at Vassar around the same time, so they joined us to help do some of the um, primary documents research down at the Dutchess County Records Office. Um, and the rest of the students were students of geophysics. And we used the geophysics to actually determine um, where graves, hidden graves are, unmarked graves are. So we we'll talk a little bit about that. And from there, we can really start understanding um, a little bit about the nature of the history of this. Now, actually, could you go back one just hit the back arrow? Now, I call this one, you know, I kind of a little bit tongue-in-cheek, you know, Rhinebeck's Black Underground. Um, of course, we learn about the history from, from graves, which could be a little bit morose, but if you go to the graveyards and walk around, I took my daughters, I have two young daughters, and we walked around the Poughkeepsie Cemetery. They're really fascinating, and as you can see from this picture, beautiful places. A few places you can go these days to kind of have a nice, peaceful, quiet place. It's a very park-like setting. And you start seeing familiar names, and these names of people that really made the Hudson Valley what it is today. The cemetery behind the Hyde Park Episcopal Church that Mike mentioned is a stunning cemetery. And the names you see there between the Astors and the Livingstons and the Roosevelts. I mean, they're, they're all over the place, all over the Hudson Valley. So, um, next slide, please. Um, and then, oh, also, I, should, I mentioned my colleague Quincy Mills. Um, Quincy is actually giving a talk at the University of Chicago this weekend, so he was not able to make it. Um, he is the African American historian at Vassar College, and we will be collaborating on this class and future projects um, as we go on. So, we'll actually have some professional historians rather than a hack like myself. Um, doing a lot of this work. Next slide, please. Okay, so a name. We, we mentioned that the, the name is sort of tongue-in-cheek, and um, this has been a really challenging class to name. I, I saw some furrowed brows when I said, we do geophysics, because it's sort of an intimidating name. So I started off the class calling it Applied Geophysics, and I had two students register. <laughs> so I got clever. Next one, please. And I tried to name it Advanced Geophysics. Mm, three students. Next one, please. I changed the name to Digital Underground, Field Geophysics. Wow, well, that class I had 14 students. <laughs> um, digital Underground refers to, believe it or not, a, a, a rap group from the 1980s that got started <laughs> in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we do actually use digital techniques to survey the underground, so I was kind of patting myself for that. I'm proud of that one. Um, but then there's some issues with that, so change it again, listen to a colleague, slide, please. Um, because at Vassar, we're very, um, class and race conscious, so we figured, well, the numbers started tapering off a little bit again, so we called it um, race and class in the Hudson Valley, because not only are we looking at, at issues of black and white, but a long time ago, it was also issues of poor and rich, and our investigations of the poorhouse, you know, there are a lot of different black people that came to the Hudson Valley, the Irish were once black, the Italians were once seen as sort of marginalized people just because of their ethnicity. So really, we started understanding that it's a lot more complicated than just this sort of black and white division that we often want to make. So, um, but the students also like having the geophysics in the name because it looks really good on their CVs. So we're going to do a class on geophysics. <laughs> Next one, please. Um, the one that we're landing on right now with the help of um, Quincy uh, Mills, again, Professor Quincy Mills, is the geophysics of slavery and freedom. And really, you can talk about different ways of enslaving people in this area. Um, a lot of indentured servants, you know, a lot of the Italians were responsible for doing the aqueduct. And the Irish came over in different areas. So that's what we're running with now. We'll see how that goes um, in the future. Um, as Mike mentioned also, this, my interest got peaked in this subject um, based on the African burial ground in New York City. Um, they were digging out the foundation for a new federal office building down in lower Manhattan by Wall Street. And they started finding bones. And they started doing the history of it. And sure enough, they see on evidence on old maps the Negro burial ground. And this is interesting. I think this uh, palisades, another word for a wall. This is where Wall Street is now. Um, and the story has it is that they used to, used to line the slaves up along the wall to sell them. New York was a big port, and that's how the, the commerce worked back in the day. So, you know, Wall Street sim still symbolizes being a marketplace, and back then it was a marketplace also, just different kinds of um, commodities were being traded. <laughs> Okay, um, so a little bit of history of the class. As Mike mentioned also, we found these amazing documents which kind of blew my Yankee behind away um, to realize that there are actually slaves in the North. 
that's not something that's common knowledge in our sort of high school level of history that we learn. I'm from Pittsburgh, but my family's from North Carolina. Slavery was a southern institution. They had plantations and roots and all these things, right? But there's actually slaves in, in the north. And in 1755, they actually did a census of slaves based on some troubles they had in New York City to know who had slaves, how many there were, what's the distribution of male and females. So you can actually look down a list in New Paltz and see all these familiar names that are these sort of old family names in New Paltz. The Du Bois, the Hasbrooks, the Beviers, um, the Freers, the, the Deos, and you know, different spellings of different names. Um, they're still around today. But you can actually see numbers of male and female slaves owned by, say, Jacob Hasbrook here have four slaves. Also from this, you can tell that <coughs> slavery was a little bit different in the North than it was in the South. There weren't very large plantations with tens or hundreds of slaves, but rather a couple slaves per household. But you can see over, over you know, the area, you know, mostly this was mostly the Huguenot area, there could have been you know, many tens, 50, 50 odd, maybe more, 60 slaves, maybe even 100 slaves in this area. So it, it was a sizable population. Um, the first site we did was a, what I call a burnt pancake. You know, you, the first pancake you make is always a little bit off. You give it to the dog, and the next ones after that are perfect. Um, we did the Locust Lawn Burial Ground in Gardner, in Ulster County, and you can see evidence also of these very interesting graves. You know, we tried to use some digital techniques to see these weathered graves, and you could actually see um, writing in this. This was the, the burial. It took us a little bit of, of um, homework to figure this out. It says ITW. This was actually Yawn to Williger. Um, grave, we figured that out in different ways, I can't remember. Never did figure out what M29 was. Anyone want to take a guess to what this, this is? AG? If you can imagine overlaying them together, it would be a mason symbol. So he was a mason of some sort. Next slide, please. Um, Mike also mentioned the Ulster County, County Fairgrounds, and I think the number I gave you must have been off because I think we found more evidence of almost over 2,000 graves oh. in this area. Um, you'll recognize this is Ulster, Fairground, Ulster County Fairgrounds site. This is the Ulster County Swimming Pool. Um, it was built in the 1980s, I believe, late 70s, early 80s. Um, as they were digging out the pool, they kept coming across bones. And as they excavated these bones, the, the excavator said, called the sheriff's office and said, to Sheriff, we keep coming up with bones in this site. The sheriff kind of knew about the stories of the history of this area and said, you know what? Don't worry about it. Just keep digging. Yeah. There's not much you could do about it because we don't know whose graves they were. Even if we did, they're at the poorhouse. They most likely don't have relatives that would be able to do anything about it. We can't tell who's buried where, so keep digging. Um, we estimated based on the records we found up at the Ulster County, um, Ulster County Courthouse area that in this area there must have been, during the time that this part of the graveyard was operating, at least 2,000 people died. We kind of did some math looking at the areas um, and also geophysical evidence right up against the area of the pool. We didn't actually go inside the pool because honestly, we didn't want to know. Please. The, uh, uh, were there stones on those graves? No, there's no markers um, at all. I didn't know there were graves though. We'll right. get to that. That's the, that's the magic. Um, it turns out, one interesting story, there's a woman who lived across the street who was in, in her 90s, and she came over and kind of said, what are you guys up to? And she remembers as a girl, there used to be wooden crosses in the field. And she, would, she and her brother would run through the fields and often trip over the crosses. Um, but that's kind of here. There's no more markers at all. Remember. No markers at all. But we can see the invisible. Um, the next site we did, based on the Ulster County Courthouse, was the Dutchess County Courthouse on our side of the river. This is as it stands today. It's now the Millbrook Infirmary. Um, this is how we see underground. This sort of area was covered completely with brambles, poison ivy, trees, everything. Yet our instruments, which I'll show, talk about later, can actually start showing patterns in the soil, different changes in the soil types, very subtle changes you can't see, but the instruments can sense them. This shows where we have evidence, this is an excellent site right here, um, of possible graves. And based on that, we found up in there, we're, uh, kicking around there, there are actually these round <coughs> markers that were in the area. So each one of these yellow dots is actually a concrete marker with a number on it. We never figure out what the number was for. Um, but then all the red dots here are evidence that our equipment, our geophysical equipment showed as being other possible graves. So on this site, we found evidence of 838 graves. 270 of them had markers. We were actually able to tie 250, almost 250 identities to graves, which is really helpful for people who do genealogy, because you might have an ancestor that came through there. You can actually point to where they are. One of the people, interesting, there was one headstone we found in there, and the last name was Hubble. 
and it turns out that he was related to the Hubble as in the Hubble Space Cell Telescope, just a relative. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Please. Next site we did was in Stormville, just just spitting distance from the Taconic Parkway, um, in sort of southern southwestern Dutchess County. Um, and each time we did it, we get better at, at doing this. The students, again, come up with these fantastic ideas. The students did in this one, which I thought was a really clever idea, was giving confidence levels to different grades. If you have several different <coughs> instruments that tell you there's something here, they end up being the dark ones. If only one instrument tells you, or we kind of have a feeling that there's something there, they would be lighter. So the dark ones here, the students were very confident that there were graves there. The lighter ones, they said, eh, maybe. <laughs> On this site, we actually found 57 upright field stones. Just stones stuck in the ground, no markings on them, but stuck in the ground here, six feet over, and here. Were they headstone, footstone combinations, or were they two headstones? Would there have been a burial here, six feet down, and a burial here? We don't know. So we say there's evidence based on the headstones and these arrangements between 30 and 80 graves of enslaved people here. We had records that said this was actually slave burial around the site, slaves owned by the Storm family. Just south of here in Hyde Park, really interesting story there. There's an interesting history of the Episcopal Church in this area. When it was found, they considered themselves rather liberal in their thinking, slide clear, to the point where the first sexton, the first person who's in charge of the grounds and actual running of the church, was a black man named Richard Jenkins. They had a picture of him, extremely well-respected member of the community, has a nice headstone in the graveyard. They were so proud of this, they actually had a section of the graveyard they believed was reserved for black. <coughs> they didn't have any burials in this section of the graveyard, so the southern end of the graveyard. This was a big mausoleum for the Livingston family. A lot of you will be familiar with the original patent owner in the, most of Columbia County. I don't know if that's actually that Livingston, but related to. They said there's no graves in this area because that's where they buried the blacks of the community. So they wanted to know how many graves were there in this area and how many and who they might have been. Unfortunately, what we discovered from our instruments was these areas in here outlined in this kind of red area was bedrock. So that far beneath the soil, you hit solid rock. And back in the 19th century, they would not have been jackhammering through this stuff. They didn't bury anybody there because they couldn't be bothered. So that was kind of a non-answer that was still a very interesting answer. We still don't know where the blacks of Hyde Park were buried. Okay. What we're talking about tonight now is the Rhinebeck <coughs> Association Cemetery here in Rhinebeck, just south of town. And if you go back there into the northern part of the cemetery, I'll show you a map where you'll find this amazing headstone. You can see it says, to the memory of Jack, a native of Africa, the most faithful and <coughs> industrious man who died at an advanced age, October 17, 1826. This is remarkable on several levels. One, the graveyard wasn't founded until 1853. Looking to my brain over there. Um, and this was 1826. Um, a friend and colleague of mine was able to actually find a font on a computer that matches the carving in this headstone almost exactly, which is pretty amazing how there hasn't been that much technology change in 180 odd years. Um, but the language in here is really interesting. We spent a lot of time puzzling over, you know, was this man a slave? Was he a, a, an indentured servant? Who put the headstone there? Where did it come from? Wow, that's all kinds of stories. So, and, you know, quite honestly, you look at Rhinebeck, you know your neighbors, it's not known for being the most diverse part of the Dutchess County. You come to Poughkeepsie, it's a different demographic down there. But back in the middle of the 19th century, it was extraordinarily diverse. One of the questions we have here is, what happened? And this is a part, part of the way we can find out what happened. Um, Lorraine Roberts, who was not able to be here tonight, has been my mentor and guide through the history of Dutchess County. Um, she knows more about the history, especially of black folks in the county, than anyone should be able to know. Said McAdoo, there's an interesting story here in Rhinebeck. We don't know exactly what it is, but this line of headstones there is the Fraser family. And next slide, please. Andrew Fraser was the patriarch of the family. You'll see that he has a flag and a veteran marker. It's always put there by Gary Slater, who I'm sorry is going to be here also. Um, but he was a, civil, a Revolutionary War veteran. Revolutionary War veteran. And he died at 102 years old or something? Almost, I think he was four days shy of his 103rd birthday. Four days shy of his 103rd birthday. I mean, amazing man. Um, but we're not sure exactly how he came into land, but either he was you know, given a pension for having served in the war and bought the land, or he was granted the land. 
I'm not exactly sure. But he became a landowner in Milan, the town of Milan. I'll show you where that is coming up in a second. But the graves around, we, we, we decided to look at this grave and see what we could learn about the history of the area based on this one family and their story in this, in this area. I'm going to pull Alicia up here in a second to talk about this because this was, this, 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 this seems like a seemingly simple family tree took months to do. I mean, this, there's an extraordinary amount of work in that, and Alicia, if you feel like jumping in here, um, I'll, I'll let you, but we'll, we'll start off. If I start screwing things up, then, then you let me know. So here's Andrew Fraser, Fraser the patriarch of the family, married Nancy Fraser. They had 11, 11 children. We're just going to look at, at one of them. Robert Fraser, who married Susan Fraser, they had a whole mess of kids also. We're going to look at some of these kids who became landowners in this area to figure out the story of how land ownership worked in this area and how they lost the land, which is also interesting. Because, you know, back in the 19th century, land was wealth. That's how people expressed their wealth. You had land, you were landed gentry, that's a good thing. Something happened this time where they were accumulating land, and then boom, it evaporated. Okay, so let's orient ourselves here. You guys all know where Rhinebeck is. Here we are in the northern part of Dutchess County. We're going to zoom into Rhinebeck. We're down here off the, off the, by the Star Library here, I reckon. Um, here's Route 9 coming through here. The Rhinebeck Association Cemetery is right here just to the west of Route 9. We're zooming in on the area right now. This is Route 9 coming down here. This is the entire cemetery here. And this green patch right back here to the northwest of this road is what they call Section E. Section E was granted in... 1853 by Mary Gerritsen, who donated it to the Methodist Church. And the Methodist Church, in turn, gave it over to the cemetery. And it was dedicated for the burial of the colored um, people in Rhinebeck. Now, Mary Gerritsen's father was Freeborn Gerritsen, yes. who was a abolitionist minister mm -hmm. in the area. And we really wanted to make a connection between Jack the African and Freeborn Gerritsen, thinking maybe he would have been a servant of the Gerritsens, or maybe the Gerritsens had taken him in and then put that monument there prior to granting the land to the Methodist Church. Unfortunately, there was a fire in the Methodist Church, Nancy? 1899. 1899, thank you and most of the records disappear, so we couldn't find um, good records of that. Um, the Fraser plot, the graves I showed you in the first one, are lined up here. Interestingly, just to the south of the road, where Section E is to the north of the road, and Section E is the Potter's Field area. If you didn't actually buy a plot in the cemetery, that's where you would be buried. You guys have a beautiful cemetery out there. It really is a stunning place. We had a, a, a fantastic fall out there, a little bit of rain a couple days, but uh, otherwise, it's really a beautiful site, um, so I, I highly recommend going out there and, and having ex exploring this. But this is Section E of the graveyard, and one thing you'll notice there is there are monuments there, and in some cases, you know, rather substantial monuments, beautiful monuments, well carved monuments, decorated monuments. It's it's a quite a beautiful area, so I recommend going down there. I want to talk about the geophysics and how we managed to do that, and what we can tell from that, and then we'll go on a little bit more about the history to learn what we can tell about the history based on what we saw from the geophysics. First step we do, we go to a graveyard, we look around. Here's my colleague Mike astutely pointing out, hey, there's a grave. <laughs> <laughs> there's some more subtle things we can do. Next slide, please. Um, during certain parts of the year, these are, are um, were, image, were done in a computer. So these outlines are graves, were done in a computer. But if you kind of close your eyes and, and you kind of get down close to the ground, you can see that the, gra the grass actually grows a little bit different in there where the soil's been dug up and put back in. So it's got different porosity, maybe it's been turned over, nutrients are mixed around with it. Whatever reason, the grass grows slightly different there. So you come out in spring, early spring, like right about now, you can see things pop out that you don't need the fancy geophysics for. So one of our students went through and outlined these areas of discolored grass. Curiously, if there's a slight, almost imperceptible depression in the ground, the leaves collect there in the fall. So you can start seeing things like a six foot long by one foot wide pile of leaves sitting in the middle of a perfectly flat field. If they, mm. um, other ones were a little bit big. We might have several graves put in together. One theory we've been working on is that perhaps they would bury 
this is going to sound a little grim, I apologize, but store people in the winter when the ground is frozen, and when there's a thaw, they can dig a grave and, and bury people at that time. Um, and also, getting down and, and dirty and actually reading the graves and seeing the headstones and seeing what we can find in them. A lot of the headstones are made out of um, limestone, and with acid rain, they start to dissolve, so sometimes it's really challenging to do that. Excuse me, these are mock graves. They have names, like, were they kept in books by the town? We have the experts here, the Kelly family. I mean, was um, it recorded their death, death certificate? Was it recorded a book? There, there's a whole stack of the... There was a lot of stuff that we, A, didn't have time to research. Oh. Um, but there were, what we did try to find, um, there were a lot of missing records, um, because like the church had burned, things like that. Oh, um, but the headstones really, really tell you um, who's there and... and you can get almost enough information out of that and go back and we, we'll talk about it later as well, but look at maps right. and kind of figure out... No, I'm talking things. about the unmarked... Uh, the the unmarked graves. Oh, the unmarked, unmarked graves. There's no, no names or nothing in there, right? No. I they mean, keep any records of the, these towns at all? <laughs> they Gary bury these Slater people and they just... Gary Slater had a map of <laughs> graves that showed... Um, graves that were being used and others that had been purchased and hadn't right. been used and they were marked with numbers. I and um, I think some of them had names attached of who bought the, the plot. Right. But really there was, there's no, nothing there's except... No record that, at all. Right. If, there, if it's no not... No record that they of, passed away either, though. It's, it's really... Yeah, I mean, it's that, very it's good. Were they citizens, though? Yeah. So how come they never hit the uh, town? There should be death records, but then actually... How come they never kept any records? The town um, the wasn't first. required to keep records oh, until, until 1880. Oh. And in New England, they did keep records from the founding of the town oh, here in, in New York State and not required to keep records. And Nancy, wasn't it also uh, an association cemetery up until the town took it over with the association? Yes, yes, abandoned yes. it. I can't and, remember what year it is. And I think so it was the um, with the town association cemetery, the records. Um, are good, but uh, there were gaps. Uh, in one case, I, I know a story about a um, uh, officer in the association who became disgusted and disgruntled, took some of the books with him, and those mm -hmm. kind of things. These things happen. happen. Excellent. Okay, so here's some of the tools we use. I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but um, it's kind of fun also. This is an electrical resistivity meter. Really, all it is is a volt meter. You stick it to the ground, you measure how easily electricity can go through the ground. If you have some soil that's been dug up in one place here, and then not dug up here, it's going to have different ability for electricity to flow through. It might have water in it, it might have air in it, but otherwise it's just going to be different. Okay? You stick it to the ground, what Justine is doing here, and you move it along every one foot or two feet, and you get a map from that. Next slide, please. This is the map that's generated. I often disagree with my students and how they present their material, but bear with me. Um, you can see kind of different model colors here. There's a little bit of a red in this area here. This is the actual data overlaid over an aerial photo. So these dots here are the actual headstones. We want to see, are there any of these model patterns that are associated with headstones? Next slide, please. The students went through and they said, OK, we can start to see, if you look at it closely, you change the color scheme, these rectangles. They took these rectangles that are the size of graves and slid them around until they kind of matched up with one of these areas where the soil properties are slightly different. And they come up with this map where three, they're pretty sure there's a good size anomaly there, there might be a headstone there, and they say, yeah, that looks like a grave, versus the light green ones here, which they say, meh. The next tool we use is the most expensive metal detector you will ever see. This is a cesium vapor magnetometer. We like this one because we like to say cesium vapor magnetometer. <laughs> Here's Alicia using the magnetometer. It is an extremely sensitive metal detector. It can pick up changes that are so subtle. If you imagine, this is, this is going to sound a little crazy, but if you, if you dig a hole, the Earth's magnetic field actually aligns the, the metallic minerals in soil as the soil is being created. If you dig a hole and fill that hole back in, those metallic minerals get all jumbled, so the magnetic field over a grave will be slightly lower than it would be next to a Next slide, please. Problem. Because it is an extremely sensitive metal detector, a lot of these headstones are put to held together by big old iron rods in them. Those things light up like a Christmas tree. 
And you can see out here, there's some metal thing going on out there. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it just blew the data out of the water. Other places where there might be metal associated with different headstones, it was too high. But in certain areas, you can start seeing patches of these six foot long by one foot wide thing. And the students went through and did this again and moved their triangles, their rectangles around and said, wow, the purple ones look like they're pretty good cemetery, pretty good graves. You notice a couple good ones over here in the Frasers. We didn't get the data on there for some reason. Um, and red ones and the green ones again are eh, not bad. The last tool we used is a ground penetrating radar. Just like radars that you use at airports and airplanes to detect moving planes, we can shoot radio waves into the ground. They bounce off of things like the bottom of a grave shaft. Looks like a lawnmower pushing across the ground. You think, what the heck are you doing out there? Next slide, please. Um, this is the only one that can actually tell us how deep an anomaly, uh, or how deep a uh, uh, a reflection is, how deep the, the sound might be echoing off. Um, and the big blue circles here are ones that are about six feet deep. So you're going to turn six foot under. There you go. So the dark, the, bright, the dark blue ones there are about six feet deep. And then the shallower ones, little white dots, maybe only about that deep. Which, what can we say? One thing is, it's a bit of a myth that people are buried six feet deep. So it didn't always happen like that, especially back in the day. It happens more like that now. Um, and again, here's the actual magnetometry data over the Fraser area, so you can start seeing some red patches down here that show pretty good evidence of graves. Next slide, please. You put it all together, and we have a computer software that can actually layer all these things together, and we start seeing things line up and matching in the, in the data, that's when we say, hey, we got something. And this is our final map. The red and purple ones are the ones that are fairly confident are graves. The yellow and green ones are ones that are eh, not so bad. But you can start seeing how the blue dots line up with the purple ones nicely, especially in the Fraser plot here. The you end. Were children buried at a different level because of child mortality was enormous? It was high. We found a, evidence of one of the Fraser children, Anna? No, um, Haley. Haley, thank you. Um, who was maybe two years old? I think very, very young. Infant age. Infant age. Um, tiny headstone, and she would have been, I believe this, this one right here, right? So yes, shallow, right there. But that's certainly the kind of thing you can go for. So this is our final map. And we can have kind of confidence levels on here with the green and the yellow, not so good, the red and the purple, better. Um, we have found evidence of about 60 graves in Section E, and we figured there were about 40-ish 40 th that were marked. That were unmarked. They were unmarked, excuse me, so 20-some that were marked. Um, so out of all these, all these sites, two-thirds of them were unmarked graves. So we found uh, evidence of 40-odd people that were buried there, perhaps with wooden crosses. Um, they would have disintegrated in the meantime. Uh, can I just add something? By all means. Um, people might wonder why there are headstones there that aren't uh, showing a grave, and that was because, uh, no, in, even in Section E, okay. um, because our data would o could only um, go back so far, like if the, if the ground had been undisturbed for 200 years, say, uh, our data wouldn't show up. It, it just wouldn't show up with our tools. So um, we could only track back so far. I forget exactly what date, what, what yes. the oldest one we were able to find was, but that explains why a lot of those headstones are much, much older than the most, than the oldest uh, grave that we were able to detect. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Just one question. Uh, yes. The Fraser plot. Yes. Uh, do you know which graves are, are, uh, don't show that uh, anything is buried there? Or? Okay, so I, I, I was starting to look at Alicia to tell, mm -hmm. tell him I should tell you a story about the Fraser plot. So, um, the Frasers had the land out in Milan, which we'll get to in a second. And they also had a burial ground out there. Okay, that's what I'm getting into. And at some point, they took the people from who were buried out in Milan and they reinterred them in Rhinebeck. Okay. And that was kind of. I don't of, know when that was. We were trying to figure out sometime around the 1900. It was between 19, 18. It was prior to 1916. There were five headstones moved to the cemetery. Um, 
the rest of them were moved since then, and that's based on the old gravestones of Dutchess County, the information that we found there. Okay. Um, Thank you. But we don't know when when the people were actually reinterred. Now, the interesting thing about old gravestones of Dutchess County, which was written in. Published in 16. 16? Somewhere in the teens. There's no mention at all of Section E. So when, I'm trying to remember the guy who wrote his name, I don't remember his Andrew name. Andrew Kenneth Boucher. Say again, sir? Boucher. Kenneth Boucher. Boucher. Okay. Boucher. Okay, Boucher. He would be walking down this road, seen this, marked it down, not seen anything over here, and there would have been graves there, which is, don't know why. So at some point they moved the Fraser graves. The question we asked was, would they move the headstones or would they actually right. dug up the remains and reinterred? That's what I was getting to. Our evidence shows that at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cases they dug eight holes. Does that mean there are eight people reinterred there? Or could they have doubled them up because they would have been bones at this time? And yeah. Next slide, please. Here's a close-up of the Fraser plot. You can see some of the beautiful anomalies here. These are what we call anomalies. We don't have evidence of graves because we don't dig holes because it's illegal. Um, but you can see how things get different colored in here. Um, and they line up nicely with several different things with the, the dots here from the ground penetrating radar. This, I believe, is electrical resistivity data. Whatever, I can't remember. But anyways, they, they line up. Um, so that, that was our evidence of looking at this. Next slide, please. OK, that's all for the geophysics. And we can ask more questions if you have more questions about that later. But um, now we want to go back. And again, yeah, I, I like this picture because I think it's a beautiful picture. You see this, this really thoughtful grave, and you think, wow, that's a really nice grave for a potter's field. Who are these people? Okay, so we started doing a little bit of research, and um, I, I, these are hard to read, so I kind of went through and, and just added a little bit of information to them. Susan Reif of Robert Fraser died in 1868. She was 74 years old, two months and 29 days. And Alfred Fraser, born in 1830, died in 1905. These are two headstones, and Alicia was mentioning you can get a lot of information from the headstones alone. Next slide, please. We were able to look at the 1865 census, and sure enough, on the census, we have a Susan Fraser and an Alfred Fraser. We have more information in 1865. They have her listed as being 65 years old, and him being 65 years old, she was a female, he was a male. Um, the M stands for mulatto, which means they're part black, at least. Um, she was a mother. And we assume that she would have been the mother. Well, not the mother. That would be fair. This was this. I'm sorry. I think I made a mistake. Susan is Alfred's. This mother. would have been 29. This is this is a mistake. But I'm sorry. Susan was Alfred's mother. Mm -hmm. So this is he was not 65 years old. Um, <laughs> and then Mary Fraser. This actually says sister behind it. Next one, please. It also tells them that Jacob Fraser, who was <coughs> Susan's hus husband. No. No. Son. Son. No. Yeah. Was in farming. Jacob and Alfred were brothers. Jacob and Alfred were brothers. Mary was their sister. Susan was the mother. Husband of Susan was? Robert. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it just says boat, New York, Albany. Not sure what that means. But at least we have some information here. And the property in the town of Milan at this time was worth $600. OK, let's look at the Fraser property. We do some more fancy computer work here. This is actually from Google Earth. Next slide, please. We found an old map. We were able to digitize this map and then overlay it in Google Earth. Next slide, please. The area we're interested in is right here, pretty much due east of Red Hook, and sort of northern part of, of Milan and northeast from Rhinebeck. Next slide, please. If we zoom in on this, we can actually see names on this. We have two maps, one from 1858, another from 1876. And we see on here an E. Fraser and a Mrs. Fraser. And over here, on the same property, JTF, which we believe is Jacob T. Fraser, and the widow Fraser would have been actually across, well, the same, same property as, as E. Fraser. So that would have been Egbert's wife after Egbert died. Mm -hmm. Also down here at the bottom, we have an A. Fraser. Mike assures me these are not his family <laughs> people, which is unfortunate because they were good landowners. I don't know. Never know. <laughs> okay, so Alicia did some, some fast homework. I'm going to let you take over here and tell, tell it the homework that you did. Come on up. Uh, Homework. This is this was cool. This, this is why. This is the last few days. This is the last few days. So this is how this is far back your instrument can. Yeah. So so the instruments. The, 
I've had some colleagues say, can we do this with Native American burials? And if all the conditions were right, I told her, maybe. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, um, how, uh, 10 years. I, mean, I, mean, I, I would say with confidence, 150, 150 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that takes you back. And so more than 150 years, I haven't tried and I, I just don't know. I'm not so as confident. The, 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 earth the earth has settled, it's rained a whole lot, gophers and termites and everything turn it over, so. Yeah, I would think it would depend on your location, too, yeah. and the type of soil and, and all of that. That's true. Okay. Um, so, I haven't quite seen all these slides yet. Brian's going to surprise me here, so. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> over here you can see this is about where the, where Widow Frazier and JTF are, is about where we determined the original farm to have been located. And this was a mystery to us because we were not able to find any deeds that described the original uh, Fraser property that Andrew Fraser had acquired um, when he when he settled here. So um, what we were able to find, I'm assuming, is on the next slide, please. <laughs> okay, in 1845, we found a deed uh, that described the purchase of a piece of property by Egbert Fraser, and um, way back then, a lot of the deeds were, the way that they described the properties was, um, you know, the property is bordered on the east by Mr. Smith, to the north um, by Mr. Isaacs, and in that kind of way. So uh, we got the idea to go back to these historic maps and find these names on the maps that describe the outline of the property and kind of play connect the dots. So we were able to find, um, you know, somewhere in that outlined area is that piece of property that Egbert Fraser bought. Next slide, please. Egbert again bought another piece of property in 1859. Again, we just went back to the historic maps, play connect the dots, and it ended up adjoining this other property that he had already bought. Next slide. There was some drama in the family. So um, Egbert died, I believe, in the early 1860s. And um, the, we don't know what happened to the property at that point until 1876 when we see that Jacob dies and uh, leaves the, the property to his uh, brother of um, Alfred Fraser to be the executor of the estate. And there we see the property outlined again, um, only it's the outline of most of Egbert's property and um, this piece here that we didn't know anything about, which we, which turns out to be the original piece of property. Owned so by that's the original piece of property owned by, owned by um, yeah. Andrew Fraser, then given to his son Robert Fraser then given to Jacob T. Frazier, <laughs> given to Jacob T. Frazier, but we don't know where that property is until we subtract it out of what Egbert's, uh, Egbert's contribution to the Frazier land was. So uh, we were able to find out pretty much where about the original property was. Next slide, please. And then Alfred in 1874 also buys a small piece of property down on the um, bottom end here. See A. Frazier. Um, in total, um, between all the purchases, I think they more than quadrupled the size of the original uh, farm that the patriarch of the family had purchased. Next one, please. Uh, next one. One more. One more. This is the timeline. The time. 1845. Go, go ahead and just go do three more. Oh, this is, this is uh, going through and telling what, Sorry. exactly what's going on, right? Okay, so Jacob dies. Okay, so we have Egbert, um, 1845, right, ten, he buys 10 acres, um, then he buys another several acres from Rufus Wilburn, and then in 1876, the brother Jacob dies, and this is after Egbert dies. Egbert leaves his property to Jacob, and then there's this crazy family issue that goes on. So Jacob um, 
apparently died and had, uh, when he died, he had some debts, you know, over $1,000 worth of debt, and he, um, Alfred Frazier was left to be the executor of the estate. He wanted to um, keep the farm in the family. He did not want to get rid of it at all. And um, the wife of Jacob, her name was Emmeline, she wanted to sell the property, split the proceeds up between her and her uh, three three children. I can't recall. I think it was three children that they had. Um, thought that that would be more profitable. Um, they couldn't agree, so Emmeline took Alfred to court. The court <laughs> decided that um, they would put the property up for auction. And um, Go ahead, next, one. next slide. Right. Okay. Henry Esselstein. This is interesting. Um, Henry Esselstein purchased the property for $1,000 at auction. Um, I'm assuming the next one is going to be right. I, a couple of days later, two weeks later, he sells the property back to Alfred. So it appears that um, what we think is that it wouldn't have been okay for, uh, even though the court uh, ruling said that family members could bid on the property at auction. It might not have been acceptable for or legal for whatever reason for um, Alfred to actually bid on the property because he had been deemed executor of the estate. So we think that Alfred hired Henry Esselstein to buy the property for him, hold it for a few days, and then sell it just to make sure that everything was kosher. Um, next. 20 years later. Alfred sells it to Mary. Uh, oh, okay. Alfred sells it, yes. Um, now, is this the 1903? He sells a piece of it in 1897, that, that little triangle that we saw at the, on the bottom of the property. He's, he sells the portion that he purchased. In, in 1903, he sells, um, right, he sells it to George Esselstein, which we think it is the brother some relation, but also an attorney um, of Henry Esselstein. Um, and then um, a couple days later, again, the following month, he sells it, <coughs> George Esselstein still sells it to Hiram Meyer. Now, Alfred sold it to George Esselstein for one dollar. When George, and we think again that he just hired it to, to just do the, conduct the transaction for him in his name. Um, he sells it to Hiram Meyer for $400, much less than Alfred paid for it a few years before, what, 20, 20 years before. And property tends to appreciate in value. So um, we're kind of like, what's going on here? Why would they, first of all, he wanted to keep the property in the family name so very badly that he went to Supreme Court and fought his sister-in-law in order to do this, hired an attorney, so that he could buy the property um, anyway, regardless, for $1,000 and then sells it for $400 20 years later. Doesn't really make sense. So we were kind of wondering what was going on that he, we feel like he had to let go of it for some reason, whether financial reasons or whatever. But at this point, we don't hear anything about the Frasers anymore. They evaporated. They're just gone. What was the, excuse me, what was the relationship of George to Henry? We're not positive. We think they might have been brothers. I thought they might have been the same person yeah. for a while. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of people by that name. Right. There's an Esselstein house in, in Hudson. Clover. I'm sorry? Clover. Yep, Clover. Uh, George lived in Lyon. Oh, he did. George, George he lived on Montgomery Street and also had property on Oak Street. And did yes. Henry live in Rebecca? I, I didn't know about Henry, so okay. I don't Thank you. No. This gentleman asked if the properties are still there. The properties themselves are still there, but they've been sold and resold and subdivided and rejoined and subdivided again. So that the original house or anything, though? The original house was um, the house where Jacob, this house, was the actual original location where we believe the original homestead was. And that house was actually torn down and then I think rebuilt again in 1980s, if I'm 
if I remember correctly, I might I might be wrong, but recently, within the last yeah, within the last thirty years, there's been a new house put. Where? Oh, here we go. This right here. That is what's the name of the road again? Willow Glen Road. Road. We drove by it. Where just, is it? In so, I'm, I'm sorry, I can show you better. No, I can't actually. Um, we, we drove by it once. We were going to sneak onto the property. We, we thought better of it. Um, <laughs> so, it's sort of the north part of Rhode Island. It's really just east of Red Hook on Willow Glen Road. Almost to, um, yeah. I didn't get to go on that field trip, unfortunately, because. I really wanted to go. You would have made us go onto the property. <laughs> I probably would. Oh, one other thing I think that I should uh, mention before we go to this one is um, recall that the the graves were moved from the farm in Milan to the Rhinebeck Association Cemetery, and we were interested in knowing when that occurred. Um, we searched through the deed record and. Um, there was a clause put in there at the time that Albert yeah, Frazier. Okay. Then Go ahead and that. This was the deed. Yes. Okay. So the. <laughs> you should have loved these things first. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It was rushed. Oh, uh, let's see. <sighs> Just read it out loud. Okay. On this twentieth day of January in 1877, it was among other things ordered adjudged and decreed by this said court that a certain action then pending in this said court between Emmeline Frazier, plaintiff, and Alfred Frazier, Susan Frazier, Jacob, and Alfred uh, Frazier, as administrator of Jacob J, I should say Jacob T. Frazier, deceased that all and singular this premises mentioned in this complaint in said action and, here, and herein after described to be sold at public auction according to the course and practice of said court. Uh, so basically this was this was where the court, um, where we found out that it, it was going to be put up to auction. Next slide. Go ahead and go through this one pretty quickly. This summarizes the court case. Okay. Said that it was going to be sold at public auction. Next. Uh, one third of the proceeds went to Emmeline and uh, the remaining two-thirds were uh, to pay the debtors, and I think if there was anything left over, it would go to the children, right? Anything left would be split up between the children. Um, next. So, so I guess Emmeline got her way, and Alfred got his way in the end, too. Um, <laughs> so everybody won, I guess. Um, Okay, so the transaction was completed in 1878 when the land was reported sold to Esselstein, Henry Esselstein, um, at auction. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so this is the, the barrel plot clause that I mentioned earlier. So we found in the deed record this clause that Alfred had, um, had um, Henry, Henry S., or George Esselstein, sorry, put into the uh, deed record subject to the right of Alfred Frazier to use for burial purposes only the burial plot of the Frazier of the Frazier's on said premises as now March 16, 1903 enclosed and when the bodies now buried here are removed or the use of said plot is discontinued for burial purposes this right is to cease and terminate this premises is hereby conveyed being the same as conveyed to George Esselstein by deed thereof from Henry, from Alfred Fraser, dated February 21st, 1903. The foregoing description is taken, blah, blah, blah. So um, this is telling us that the burial plot exists on the Fraser farm. Alfred Fraser is selling the farm, but he and his family are allowed access to the burial plot only unless at some time in the future these bodies are to be moved somewhere else. Um, so we wanted to know where they actually moved and the headstones suggested that they were being moved prior to 1916. Next slide please. Go ahead. Um, okay, so don't, don't go away. I'm not, I'm not going away. Okay, so um, again we can start looking through the records to find out who these different Frasers were, and you see a slight change in the spelling of the name here, but they're still Frasers. Um, this is a curious one um, from 1865, where it talks about Louis, Phoebe, and Emily, 
Lewis and Phoebe were married. And Emily was Lewis, the and yes. And, and right. Emily was the niece from Chicago. Um, I can't recall where she was from, but um, uh, Alan, yes, she was their niece living in their home in, in Rhinebeck. So again, they're all, this is Mulatto there. Next one, please. Um, it says also they were, uh, she was employed as a cook and boat, whatever that means. Okay, so we're able to find, next please, um, a grave for Louis M. Frazier. Um, he died in 1889, 67 years old. Next one, please. Curiously, we found a map um, from... 18... That's 1876. 76 map, where we see Esselstyn McCartley on Montgomery Street. Fancy. Um, it was a law firm, and then Louis M. Frazier, Ellen Frazier, had a house down here on South and Parsonage. The house still exists. We knocked on the door, and the woman brought us in, and we could see the old part of the house and the old hearth. It was from the 19th century. It's pretty, pretty cathartic. That was the same day that I missed the other one, too. You missed that one, too? I, they were both on the same day, and I missed them. Oh, because it was raining. We couldn't go into the fields. We drove around. <laughs> um, okay, so do you want to do that? Yeah, I can do it. Good, thank you. Um, so, if, if you're, I think you can ask me. Next, next. Okay. So we were interested in demographic change. We wanted to know if people were dying and being buried in the cemetery or if they were actually moving out of Rhinebeck. Um, something that Brian didn't mention at the beginning, or if he did, I missed it, was there's a whole section of Section E where there used to be wooden crosses. Um, we were told by members of the community, but there's no actually proof that they were there. And over the years, if they were there, the weather rotted them away. So they no longer exist and there are graves there that are unmarked because of that. So um, we decided to go back to these historic maps. This one is one from 1858. It's just upstairs here on the wall in the yeah. team's office. <laughs> and, um, and see if we could match up some names on the maps to names on headstones, which we were able to do. So up at the top of the map there you see D. Savoy. On this headstone are marked the four names of four of the children of Dennis and Harriet Savoy. So, you know, that's probably Dennis Savoy up there. But what's interesting is that we don't see in the cemetery a headstone for Dennis Savoy or Harriet Savoy. So one option is that they're buried in an unmarked grave where one of those wooden crosses used to be. But that doesn't really seem to fit with our picture of these people who were ab able, obviously, to afford Beautiful. A, a headstone, beautiful headstone for, for their children. Why wouldn't they also have a headstone if they were financially stable enough to purchase one? Um, so it suggests that they probably moved out of the area. Next slide, please. Um, this is also the case with the Johnson family. We have Harry W. Johnson, son of William Johnson. You see William Johnson on the map, but William Johnson is not anywhere in the cemetery. In, on a headstone. Um, William Johnson, again the same thing, we have Helen Johnson, wife of William Johnson, but we don't see William Johnson's headstone in the cemetery. So did he move away or is he buried in an unmarked grave? Next slide please. Um, Hannah, wife of Henry Williams, died March 6th. Um, same thing, Henry Williams is on the map, but we don't find his headstone in the cemetery. And I'd also like to mention that the reason that um, we would expect to find them in the cemetery was be because in 1846, I believe, the town decreed that there could no longer be any churchyard burials. So people, if they didn't own the property, had to be buried in the cemetery in Rhinebeck. So, um, and we know that these are black families at the time probably didn't own these properties. They were probably renting. Um, so the choice would be either unmarked grave or, um, or moved out of the area, unless, of course, they were lucky enough to own property. So One of the things that gave us fits, this was 1858. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that gave 1858. us fits about this map, we weren't sure if these names were people that actually own the property or just live there, because on one of the earlier or later maps, there was an Esselstyn. Yeah. It was listed as on Oak Street, and Oak Street was known today as being the place where the black folks lived. So Esselstyn, we figured, must have owned the property, and somebody else was living there, perhaps there was nobody living there. 
next one is this last Thomas, and that's, that's it. Um, yep, Thomas, but we do find Theodore Thomas um, in the cemetery, so we were able to actually match this name up um, to, to a, a headstone to the name on the map. Next slide, please. What about Jack? Can we talk about Jack? Go ahead. Your theories were great. I Jack was so interesting because, first of all, we were not able to find his grave. Um, right, it, it goes back. It goes back too far for our equipment to detect that there was an actual grave there. But um, his headstone says he died in 1826. Now, this land, remember, um, that the headstone is on was not donated in, uh, until 1853 to the cemetery, and in 1827 we were able to find out that Freeboard and Gerritsen still owned this piece of property. And as an abolitionist, um, he did actually own slaves uh, prior to this. I think in, in the 1700s, I can't recall the actual date, but in the 1700s he did, I think it was 1755, he became an abolitionist and he decided to free all of his slaves. So it's interesting that this man who um, it says he was an African of African descent, was buried on this piece of property owned by this abolitionist at the time. Who was, who was he? Was he a slave at some point in time? Did he stay on uh, as being employed by Freeborn Garrison? We don't know. We're not able to find out anything about Jack. It says he died at an advanced age. We so talked a lot about what would be an advanced age from a native of Africa, 26. 96. So they'll make a big difference as to where you might have come from. So. Free Blood Garrison, I believe, came I can't recall exactly. Mm -hmm. My oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Here's a question, Rob. So, very, you know, there were all kinds of freaks of uh, people who were dirty them, all kinds of the southern states. All the slaves, did they come from the south? Or were they northerners? Some were northern Some slaves. More northern slaves? Right, and this is also, this whole um, piece of research is also very interesting because the time period that we're researching, there were, this was the time of the Great Migration, there were blacks flocking to the north during this time. And we see blacks leaving from Rhinebeck um, during during this time. Over three generations of historic maps, we can find that same trend that I was just illustrating going on. So, um, you know, he it may have been somebody who came from the South, might have been somebody from here. Also, um, we don't know if Jack was free or if he was a slave because the time of the manumissions also happened just right around the same time of his death, so we don't know if he died a free man or if he was still a slave at that time too, or if he ever was. If he were, if you know, if he had some kind of um, relationship with Freeborn Garrison and was possibly working for him, then he most definitely was not a slave because Freeborn Garrison was an abolitionist and freed all of his slaves. So, but you know, it was. We weren't able to find any birth records, and this only having a first name was tough because when you went through the the records, you know there might have been five Jacks who were slaves in the slave record, not knowing whether he was a slave or not. It was just so difficult to find out anything about him. So we just kind of came up with a hypothesis, what we thought might have been the case. What's your hypothesis? The, um, that he probably uh, Being, being, he probably worked for, or had some kind of working relationship with the Garretsons in some way, um, because why would you, why would you bury, during that time, some black person who you didn't know, on your property? That wouldn't make sense. So he had to have some kind of a, a working relationship, I think, with the Garretsons. But other than that, and it was a nice monument. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, it was a beautiful monument, and it, and it had such a nice inscription on there that there had to be some sort of emotional bond in some way, or some kind of a working relationship. We, we, we read it, it was, it was very respectful. Yes. Mm -hmm. inscription, very, you know. I have a question. Yes. Are there, are there uh, Freeborn Garrison papers extant? 
there could research could be done into a, a correspondence and there were one one um, document that we looked at was a compilation of his own manuscripts that was written that was put together by a close friend of his, um, but nothing. There was nothing in there that described any, that mentioned Jack at all. Yes. Go any ahead. photographs of any of these uh, slaves or or the uh, or, or the farmers that you were talking about? Any photographs? Of? You know, uh, the people that you mentioned, the phrases, any photographs? No, that's, and that's nothing. interesting. No records of four cameras. Mm -hmm. In other words, there was nothing no. written, no, it was just mm -hmm. essay. There were some written records. Uh, right. We found a book about um, some families in Dutchess County that outlined the the family trees, but it was all right. uh, it was all done by this guy who went around and asked people questions. In other words, they didn't have a census at that time. There was a census. There we looked through census. census records, but there just we weren't always able to find the information we were looking for. So, like Freeborn oh. Gerritsen freed his slaves the year before the census was done. Right. The census that was done prior to that was while he was still in his teenage years, and so that he wouldn't have owned slaves at that time. So there's no record of his slave ownership census right. during the time period that he did own slaves. So it's, it was just very... What about blacks in his household? <sighs> if, if he had anyone living in his that. household that uh, was black, it would show up in the census. Right. Oh, well, that that was the... that, But that's the whole... So which, which sense? Do you remember which sense it would... I'm trying to remember well, the dates. Uh, if you were looking at 1810 census or 1790 census, any of them would show um, how many black male and how many black females yeah, were in that same household if they were in the same household. I can't recall if we, because you're right, and we should have looked for that, and I can't recall if we actually looked for that or if we said, oh, process of elimination, we won't find slaves, but didn't think to look for black people living in the household. So I think that's a possibility maybe we haven't Check checked into. Sense. I remember correctly, it was really late in the 1790s when you made well, slaves. 1770, 17, I can't remember exactly the date. Worthwhile checking. So, so we, we finished up here because I know I've started seeing some people leave and we've talked as long as we should. We have a few un unanswered questions and um, these are, go ahead. Um, go ahead, just do this three, I think. Go ahead, okay, go ahead. Oh. No, back. <laughs> so we don't know. Um, we don't know much about Andrew Frazier himself, other than him being a Revolutionary War veteran, and the fact that he had 11 children, There's, because... I don't want to interrupt you, I'm sorry. But uh, if you look at Little Nine Partners, that's yes. the history of it. That's actually where we got our first bit of information. Okay. But it does say, yeah, I think he was part Scottish. Scottish. Yeah. Yeah. Scotch. Scotch uh, descent, yes. Um, and... He had 11 children. Some of the names were given to us. Um, we focused on Robert just because his headstone was in the cemetery and we could kind of put together a family tree from there and we actually weren't able to find anything on any of his other children. That doesn't mean without some more research that we wouldn't... That we wouldn't. There was one living in Pine Plains. His name is uh, Ernie Fraser. He died in 1980. And he was, I used to work with him and he was a descendant of Ernie he had a daughter. I mean, she's still also, the daughter's names, Andrew's daughter's names, were not given in the Little Nine Partners. Uh, they only list the names of the sons. And then says the daughter, uh, this daughter married into the May family or something like that, but there's no first name to go by, so the daughters remain kind of nameless in that sense. Um, also, we don't know exactly how Robert got the property. He might have purchased it from his father. He may have inherited it from his father. We don't know because we haven't located it. So Robert was one of the sons of Andrew. Uh, right. Robert was Andrew's son. So we don't know how he actually obtained the property. And um, we don't know what happened to the rest of the Frasers. So did they move out of Milan? Did they, um, you know, Louis M. Frazier was in... Um, Rhinebeck, but uh, to our knowledge, he didn't have any children. So, what what happened to all of the rest of the Frasers? Where'd they go? Um, again, Jack, we don't really 
uh, know what happened to, uh, in his life, who he was, so we'd like to be able to find something out about that. And then the Oak Street residents, for what reason were they moving out? Because that's what we believe was happening. They were moving out of Rhinebeck. Where did they go? What reasons did they have for leaving? Were they financial reasons? Were they pushed out for some other reason? We don't know. Also, what were their jobs when they were here? Um, yeah, and what did they do? Because we were told that this was a rich community full of artisans. Um, Obviously, many of them were able to afford headstones, so it seemed like they were had some kind of financial stability. And so, why were they leaving? Is there another slide? Or last slide. Then. And thank you to Lorraine Roberts, uh, Nancy and Arthur Kelly, Stephanie LaRose. She's a is she an intern, GIS. GIS person at the Vassar College, and to Gary Slater, um, who is the what's the word? Caretaker. The caretaker at the cemetery where we did our research. So thank you. All of you. The Kelly's really. Working.